today is Good Friday and I have come for a trip to um, Snows Hill Manor which is in the village of Painswick in the Cotswolds and it's a house that used to be owned by the architect and collector Charles Wade. So it's a really interesting house because it's not one he lived in, he bought it when it was dilapidated, renovated it and filled it with all of his objects that he collected so that he could turn it into a museum. So it's really fascinating, I'm really excited to have a look around but first bookshop. What I love about National Trust properties is they always have secondhand bookshops and I am ready to get lost in here for a, a good hour just looking through all the books um, and also what I love is look at this there's an original um, late 19th century letter printing press so that's really cool but yeah um, I'm just really looking forward to having a good day but first I'm just gonna have a look at these books. <laughs> How beautiful is this house? And what I love about this house is not just the house, but the view. It's just got views of the countryside and it is stunning. And there's lots of sheep with lambs and it's just really pretty. Um, and what an incredible man that he bought this dilapidated house and turned it into this. Snow's Hill is the unconventional manor which belonged to Charles Wade, a man who is best described as eccentric. He bought this house in 1919 after the First World War with the intention of creating a stage for his weird and wonderful collections. Charles Wade's love of collecting probably comes down to his childhood living with his grandmother. At the age of seven, Charles went to live with his grandmother, known as Granny Spencer, in Great Yarmouth. In her house was an impressive 18th century lacquered cabinet, which held an array of artefacts and curiosities. As a treat each Sunday, Charles was allowed to open the cabinet with its magic key and inspect its collections, down to all of the items hidden in its intricate drawers and recesses. The items included old family treasures, from a little wax angel with golden wings and musical boxes, to shells, butterflies and silver spoons. This experience left a deep impression on Charles and led him to start his own collection. He saved up 18 weeks worth of pocket money to buy his first items, which include three small bone carved shrines of St Michael and two of the Virgin and Child. Okay, this room is really creepy, it's filled with samurai soldiers. Later, he studied to qualify with the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, and worked in London. He was always naturally creative, not only in architectural design, but also in illustration, drawing and painting. Mainly what drew him to items were the artisanal qualities. Anything that displayed good craftsmanship, traditional methods and attention to detail was of value to him. Charles Wade himself said, what a joy these old things are to live with, each piece made by the hand of a craftsman, each has feeling and individuality that no machine could ever attain. When he bought Snows Hill, it was a run-down Tudor manor house which came with a cottage and 14 acres of land. After intensive remodelling and restoration, he transformed the farmyard into an arts and crafts style garden and created a museum to house his collection, while he chose to live in the adjacent modest priest's house. Of course, such an impressive collection did not go unnoticed, and visitors to the manor during the early 20th century include the likes of J.B. Priestley, Virginia Woolf, Graham Greene, and even Queen Mary. The room that stood out to me the most is Anne's room, a name which links to the room's history. On the 13th of February in 1604, the eve of Valentine's Day, 16-year-old Anne Parsons eloped with her lover, Anthony Palmer, in the dead of night, despite already being engaged, and they escaped together to Snows Hill Manor, which was owned by one of her relatives. They tracked down a vicar to marry them in this very room that was soon discovered by Anne's guardian, John Warne, who tracked them down in the neighbouring town of Chipping Campton, where the couple had gone after the ceremony. Anne was separated from her lover, and while some claim the marriage was annulled, others say the case was never resolved. Today, there have been many claims of a ghost of a young girl wearing a green dress, which haunts Anne's room. Footsteps have been heard, as well as the sound of a girl weeping, whilst others have felt cold spots and a sudden strong sense of sadness. Since Anne spent very little time at Snows Hill and didn't actually die there, it is unclear whether this is her ghost or not. Nonetheless, I was intrigued by the story which is so closely tied to the room. was 
probably one of the most eclectic houses I've ever walked in. Charles Wade, the person who lived here, was a collector and he collected anything that looked handmade, um, rustic, that reminded him of the times before machinery because this was during the early 1900s when machinery was becoming more popular. Basically he collected anything and everything that caught his eye so it's just such a fascinating house to walk through and I really loved it. This is the house and this is the view. It's literally so idyllic. So what's also really interesting to me as an architecture student is the fact that Charles Wade used to make model houses and create model villages. So this is his studio, which is in his garden, and you can see these beams are really low. Like, I'm short and I'm five foot three and I still have to duck to get under these beams. And he's got a really cute desk with his candle. And over here, there's actually lots of old pictures of him making the model villages, which is really cool. And then, here yeah, there's another desk, and the actual houses themselves. How cool are these? I need to hold the camera up. How cool are these? really incredible because actually as an architect student we have to make models quite often they weren't as beautiful as these they're normally just with cardboard and um, but I just think it's really cool that he used to do this as a hobby and he has such a cool studio I'd love to have a studio like this to work in um, and outside the view is just spectacular of the garden and the flowers and there's the house and there's so many tulips and daffodils at the moment it's just stunning What's an idyllic place to sit? Like this is literally his desk and he'd just sit with that view. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> I would love to have this as my studio. This poop can only mean one thing. Yep. <laughs> it's a pigeon house. Lovely. These beautiful forget-me-nots, they're everywhere at the moment. And what I love is I think I've read that in one language they're called um, mouse ears because I don't know if it's focusing. But the little flower heads look like mouse ears. It's just really sweet. I love forget-me-nots. The colour is such a beautiful shade of blue. I might pick some later, some wild ones, because there are some wild ones near where I live to put them in a little vase because I just love forget-me-nots. And this is his vegetable patch. It's quite a good size actually, really neat and beautiful, I love it. I would love to have one like this one day. How beautiful is this view? I just can't get enough of it. And also look, lambs! Walking back from the manor, um, we, I passed this field of lambs and sheep and they're so cute. And I'm just sitting watching them and they literally came right up to the fence. It's so sweet, but that view is just classic England, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, but a snow cell probably is one of my favourite National Trust properties because it's very unique, it's a beautiful house, lovely gardens, but it's just the views. I would love to wake up to this view every day. I just had a little wander around the village of Snowtill and it's really quaint so you can see how cute the cottages are and behind me this wall is the property that I was just in so there's the house and this is all the garden so it literally backs right onto the village and there's a really cute church and a pub and it's just like a classic English village with a red telephone box as well but yeah look at 
at these windows. This is what I love about old buildings when they're really quirky and unique. This is the side of the house that I was in. And just look, there's some that have been blocked off. Apparently he did it um, to have one source of light in certain rooms. So he really controlled the light when he renovated it. But I just think that's really cool. I've just hopped out the car because look at this. I love England and around this time of year, so April, the fields are filled with bright yellow and it just looks incredible. And this is all rape seeds. So they use the seeds of these flowers to make rapeseed oil, but it just looks sunny. Like as far as the eye can see, it's yellow and it's just beautiful. So today is Saturday, I've come for a picnic in Bybury, it's a beautiful village and Arlington Row is a really famous row of cottages where basically they were built um, for weavers in the medieval times and today they're just holiday cottages but they're really beautiful, it's a bit busy because it's Easter weekend but it's been really nice to have a picnic with such a beautiful view. What's really funny about Arlington Row is that once an American tourist came to visit and he fell in love with the cottages and he wanted to buy them, ship all of the stones to America and then reconstruct the row of cottages in America, which I found really funny. He wasn't allowed to do it because they're protected by the National Trust, but that just shows how magical the cottages are. <laughs> It was really lovely to sit outside and eat outside. It really makes me feel like summer's on the way and coming. And it was very busy because obviously Easter weekend, everyone's gone out, but it was lovely nonetheless. And now I've come back home and in preparation for Easter, I'm going to bake some hot cross buns. It's my first time making hot cross buns myself. Normally we get them from the local bakery, but I thought, why not? I'm really into baking, trying out different breads and things. So why not give hot cross buns a try? For those of you who don't know what hot cross buns are, they're basically little bread rolls um, with a white cross on the top made of flour and water. And they were originally invented by a monk in St Albans Abbey in the 14th century to distribute to the poor. And traditionally they're eaten on Good Friday or just generally all throughout Easter time and springtime in England. Everyone loves hot cross buns. You can either have them just as a bread roll with a cup of tea or toast them with butter and when the butter just soaks into the bun, it's delicious. Um, so I'm going to try and make some hot cross buns now. I've started preparing my ingredients. So I have 500 grams of flour, 75 grams of sugar, 30 grams of fresh yeast, which I am going to dissolve into milk, which I have warmed here, 300 milliliters of milk, whole milk, ideally, because um, normally I go for dairy-free milks, but when I bake, I always use cow's milk because otherwise I just find that things don't rise as well, they don't turn out as good. And then also um, 40 grams of melted butter. So I've got everything ready here and I'm going to start. Also, um, sorry, I nearly forgot. Um, what makes hot cross buns special is the spices and the raisins you put in. So I've got 200 grams of sultanas here and also some cinnamon and some mixed spice. So um, the recipe says to use two teaspoons of mixed spice and one teaspoon of um, cinnamon, but I think I'll probably put more in because I like really strongly spiced baked things, so I'll be putting more in. Um, and I believe that is all. Oh, no, I nearly forgot. Also an egg, um, one egg, but you'll see as I'm putting everything in what I do. So you start by putting all of the dry ingredients in the bowl. So I've got my 500 grams of flour, Some 
75 grams of sugar. Your two teaspoons of cinnamon, or if you're like me, then you can double that and put four in just because I really love cinnamon. of ground mix spice. Now with a spoon just mix together all of the dry ingredients in the bowl. So when that's all combined, next what you need to do is get your milk. So I've got it in a pan here, I've just heated up the milk. And you don't want it to be too hot, just warm, so you can put your finger in and it's warm to the touch. And then you're going to get your um, yeast. You can use the sachets of yeast, so you could use one of those um, 7 gram sachets of yeast or 10 gram. I've got 30 grams of fresh yeast, because if you have fresh yeast, you need to put in more. And I find that fresh yeast just makes things rise better. I prefer to use it and it gives it a better flavour. But that's just personal experience, and obviously it depends what you have available to you. So I'm going to dissolve that into the milk and then put this into the dry mixture. Okay, so now that the yeast is fully dissolved in the milk, and um, you'll notice when you mix it, there'll be no more lumps, it'll be completely smooth. Then you add it to the dry mixture. the melted butter into the mixture. And then you can put the um, dough hook onto the KitchenAid and you can start to mix that all together. a jug or a bowl and to beat it so that you can add it to the, the dough. a bit lighter in colour that shows that it is um, ready to add in and you can just pull that straight in. And the final thing to add is um, 10 grams of salt. So 10 grams is about the same as two teaspoons. So I'm just going to use the spoons because it's easier to put that in. you can also um, pop in the sultanas and also normally well traditionally hot cross, hot cross buns would have candied peel like candied orange and lemon peel but I don't have any I forgot to get it so I'm just going to add in raisins but if you have it then you should add that in too. So there we go those are all in there and I will mix those into the dough. batter here. I'll bring the camera a bit closer. But when it starts to look like this, that means it's ready. It's all combined and it's created a lovely um, thick dough that's holding together. So now I am going to um, cover this with cling film and let it sit for an hour and a half. I know, a long time, 
the first weight out of several, but you need patience to get a good result and for it to fry as well. So yes, yeah, so like I said, I'll get some cling film, cover it, and in an hour and a half, I'll be back. really well. So now um, I'm going to give it a second kneading. So I'm using Mary Berry's recipe. Mary Berry is basically the queen of baking in England. She is phenomenal and I'm using her recipe because her recipes are always really good. And she said that if you let it sit, do a second kneading and then let it sit for a further hour, then apparently they rise a lot better. So see how it goes. I'm going to put it back under the KitchenAid. Um, I'm kind of scared to mix it actually because it's risen so well and I feel like it's just going to flatten but apparently this is what you're meant to do so I'll put it back in and just turn so now it's supposed to knead for 5 minutes and then I'll leave it for a further hour for the second time and it has risen a lot again you can see it's gone all the way to the top of the bowl and now it's time to divide it into the 12 buns because this recipe is enough for 12 buns. I've prepared two baking trays of baking paper so that I can have six on each tray and basically I'm going to take the, the dough and put it onto a floured surface. I've already sprinkled flour onto this surface. Let it out. It's really fluffy. Oh my gosh. It looks so good. And the smell. I can't even describe to you the smell. It's incredible. Oh, it's such a fluffy dough. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm so excited to bake this and see how it comes out. Um, but if it comes out really good, then I won't be buying hot cross buns anymore. I'll just be making them because um, homemade is always better, isn't it? I love to make anything homemade if I can, and obviously if I have the time to, but I feel like the time is always worth it with these sorts of things. So, I've got the dough here on the flour surface, and I'm basically just going to roughly divide it into 12. I've got a knife to help me do that. So, I'll cut it in half, and when you do this, um, you should try not to squish the dough too much, because if you squish it, I feel like Normally, when I make breads and it doesn't rise very well, I try to leave it as fluffy as possible. So, yeah. So what I'm doing is basically just cutting it into twelfths. And then with my hands, just lightly and um, gently putting them into little wall shapes and then I'll place them onto the tray. Um, and yes, like I said, don't squish them too much. Even when you're forming them, just be very gentle and let them kind of naturally form a sphere and place them. Like so, I don't know if you can actually see that tray. Wait, let me, there you go. And I'm just working my way through all of this day. good and it, it's really soft and malleable and a really lovely dough so I have a feeling they're gonna rise well
two trays um, with all of my buns on them. And now this is the last time that you have to let your buns sit. So there's a third time that you have to leave them to rise. I know a lot of waiting, but things that end up tasting this good are always worth the wait. So I'm gonna grab some tea towels. Here they are, and basically you need to use the tea towels to cover the buns. And obviously don't squash them, just lay them gently over the top, um, like so. And I'll just um, tuck the edges under the tray so that they're all in place. And it's, this is just to prevent them drying out. then you need to leave them for between 40 minutes to one hour, I would lean towards an hour, until the buns have grown a lot. Um, but yes, just leave them for an hour in a warm place and then you'll be ready to finally bake them. And the baking, I can assure you, doesn't take long, it only takes 15 to 20 minutes. So we're nearly there, the end is in sight. Okay, so now that my buns have been resting for an hour, it's time to put the crosses on them and then put them in the oven. So I've preheated the oven to 200 degrees Celsius for a fan oven, but otherwise it would be 220 degrees Celsius for a regular oven. And um, to make the paste for the crosses, it's very easy. All you need is um, 100 milliliters of water and 75 grams of plain white flour, which I have measured out here. So I'll just pour that into the water and then mix it together. So I've just grabbed my hand whisk to do that, just to make sure that the paste is really smooth and there's no lumps in it. So the next step is to put this paste into a piping bag or just a plastic bag that you cut a, col a hole into the corner of. I have this um, small sandwich bag that I'm going to use. Um, I'm just going to put the paste in and then cut a hole in the corner. I think that would be good enough to just squeeze it out because I haven't got any piping bags. As you can see, I'll show you the consistency of the paste to get an idea of it. It should be really thick and gloopy because when you, you want to be able to pipe um, the crosses onto the buns. So I'll just put that into the bag. This one obviously wasn't made into a very good ball because it's broken, but even if they're not perfect cycles, I don't mind. I like the rustic homemade look. Um, but yeah, they've risen very well, as you can see. They're really big and fluffy. Um, oh, the smell is incredible. I love cinnamon and mixed spice. At Christmas, at Easter, I'm just always using it. It's amazing. So I'll cut the hole into the bottom. And I'm only a very small one so that um, I can have more precision when I'm doing the crosses. And basically, the cross should just be a plus sign um, that goes all the way along the buns. And um, what you can do is run the paste all the way down the length of um, the three buns to make it easier to do. So we'll see how this works. Hopefully it'll be okay. Oh no, drip the plastic onto the bun. <laughs> just in case, um, because you never know how fast they're going to cook in the oven. And I would turn them around um, a few minutes before they're meant to be done, just to make sure they bake evenly. And um, so, yeah, it's as easy as that.
out incredible. I'm so happy with how they turned out. They rose really well. They're just so beautiful. Lovely golden colour. And I ended up putting them in for 15 minutes, turning them around and then leaving them for another 2 minutes. So that's 17 minutes in total. Now what I'm going to do is I've got some maple syrup here. And I'm just going to glaze them. So they've just come out, they're still hot. And I'm just going to um, just brush them with some maple syrup. And it'll make them go lovely and shiny. And give them a bit of sweetness because there isn't much sugar. I'm considering in all of the buns there's only 75 grams compared to 500 grams of flour. There's not actually much sugar. But the syrup glaze will just give them that little bit of sweetness. And yes, like I said, to make them look shiny and professional. And voila, they are finished and they are beautiful. Look how amazing. I know this one um, is a bit misshapen, but I think in general they turned out very well. I'm very happy with them. So yeah, it was a success. Well, actually, I need to taste them first, but from the way they smell, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a success. Okay, so I've taken one of the buns and I'm about to try it. I'm really looking forward to it. It's so, I don't know if you can see how, I've taken one of the misshapen ones, so it's not one of the prettiest, but it's so fluffy and soft. I don't know if you can see that, but it's literally like spongiest bread I've ever had. Okay, I'm just going to break it open. Oh my gosh. Oh, this looks incredible. Okay. And because I love butter, I'm going to slather some butter onto here so it melts into the bread. Because it's still hot and fresh from the oven. <laughs> okay, this is like such a big treat. I don't think there's anything better than the smell of fresh bread when it just comes out of the oven. Um, or just fresh bread in general. Or bread in general. I love bread. <laughs> Don't know if you can tell. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is like my favourite thing. Fresh bread. Okay. Because I like to be generous with my butter. And now it's time to try it. Okay, ready for the taste test? Three, two, one. I'm never going to buy hot cross buns again. Whoa! That's so good, I'm going for a second bite. Mm. Okay, you need to go and try this recipe out because it's foolproof, really easy to do, and you get the most delicious hot cross buns I've ever had. I mean, not, you know, <laughs> to hype myself up or anything, but it's genuinely the best hot cross bun I've ever eaten. And yeah, so it turned out really beautifully. And yeah, I'll put the recipe link below for Mary Berry's recipe for hot cross buns, so you can try it out yourself. But that was really fun to make, and they are really good. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please like it and subscribe to my channel to join me on more adventures and have a very happy Easter. Probably by the time this video is up, it will already have been Easter, but I hope you had a lovely Easter and I will see you next time. Bye.